All right. Well, thank you. Good morning um, for attending October's case reviews. Um, As we move forward, just a reminder that this information is confidential and privilege protected by HIPAA in that distribution, copying, or discussion of this outside of this educational purpose is prohibited. Um, moving on to case one. And I believe I saw Dr. Mock, so that's going to be awesome because there's a couple of things I think that he can uh, talk about in one of these cases. Um, so this is a case of a 68 year old female who EMS was called for, I believe it was a, um, unknown problem. When they arrived, they found that the patient did not answer the door. Um, they had to gain access through a window. And when they found the patient, she was writhing around on the floor, I believe, she uh, presented with altered mental status and generalized pain. She was alert. She was uh, protecting her airway and her airway was open. Her skin was pale, warm, dry with no active bleeding. Vital signs were obtained within eight minutes of patient contact noted to have a heart rate of 53, a blood pressure of 161 over 82 and a respiratory rate that was not recorded for the first 10 minutes. Her SpO2 was 100%. Her past medical history included gallbladder, anxiety, and hypertension, according to the electronic medical record. Her medications were unknown. And as mentioned before, the fire department gained access to her by breaking in. Um, she had called her daughter and she was incoherent, which prompted her daughter to call 911. In, that addition, in addition to pain, the patient was complaining of nausea and shortness of breath in that um, the patient and her daughter both report that there's no active history of drug or substance abuse. Um, this call occurred at 9 o'clock in the morning. Vital signs is reported to you guys already. Um, she was unable to answer any questions appropriately and that she was a difficult historian according to the documentation that she had reported pain all over and then potentially even in her chest depending on um, when the person asked her and then at eight minutes they repeated her vital signs she had a she had a, a heart rate of 53, a blood pressure 161 over 82, respiratory rate wasn't reported, and uh, uh, oxygen was at 100% of room air. At 14 minutes, they checked her blood glucose, which was essentially upper, upper limits of normal at 200. At 19 minutes, they obtained a 12 lead. Her heart rate at that time was 99. Her blood pressure is 154 over 72. Her respiratory rate was 24, and her SATs were 94%. Here's her 12 lead. Looks like neurocomplex, non-tachycardic, no okay. obvious um, ST abnormalities, although poor baseline activity, which okay. might be related to the patient's movement, um, would be helpful to indicate if there was any issues with getting a good tracing. At 21 minutes, they initiated transport. At 30 minutes, they obtained another set of vital signs. Heart rate of 53, blood pressure 169 over 84, respiratory rate wasn't reported in SATs of 100% of room air. Um, at 33 minutes, they arrived to the hospital. They didn't document that they placed an IV, so if it's not documented, it's not done according to at least review and um, legal review too. They came to Legacy Salmon Creek code yellow and they upgraded to code red. Um, in route as a side note. And there's no Pulsera because currently we are not using that at Legacy. Um, in review of this, this is um, Dr. Mott, do you want to, I don't want to put you on the spot, do you want to give the feedback because this is the feedback you provided? No, I'm, I'm happy to. You can always put me on the spot. Yeah. Um, so um, obviously, this is a you know difficult situation, um, and so 
there's a great job gaining entry. It's a good initial assessment. And it, the course of the events were really well described. It was easy to follow along from the chart. Um, and, uh, and it was really good that the 12 lead was obtained um, and then, uh, then upgraded to acuity red. Uh, just based on the patients, uh, the patients on the bradic, pa pa uh, the patients bradycardia it just didn't just didn't appear well. Um, there, uh, the the one uh, charting um, area that I can offer for improvement is um, is just to use caution with terms like unwilling. Um, you can say things like not participating in assessment, but it's you know we don't know the patient's motivation and and this is someone who it, you know at least from reviewing the record seems like was you know systemically ill yeah. and you know we we have to assume that it's a result of the patient's illness rather than um, a, a volitional choice on the patient to to not be able to provide history. Great, thank you very much. In, in the ED course, um, the EKG didn't show any obvious abnormalities. Her high sensitivity troponin was elevated at 0 0.38. They did a CT of her aorta trying to evaluate why her um, presentation might be re related to, which was unremarkable. And because of her ongoing chest pain, her detectable troponin, she was transferred to Peace Health. Um, because Legacy did not have PCI over the weekend at that time, but they will by the first of the year. At uh, Peace Health, her cast showed that she had severe stenosis of her OM1, which was stented, and she was discharged in good condition. Her plan was for cardiac rehab, and her diagnosis was an instem. So this case uh, and, was brought. Oh, go ahead. Oh, just one thing. Um, Salmon Creek is planning to go live with 24-7 PCI um, in the first part of 2024. Um, tentative date is January 15th, but obviously we'll we'll update you. Um, but as of right now, there's not a plan to go live on January 1st. Okay, great. Thank you. And this case was uh, recommended because of acute coronary syndrome doesn't always present with our typical findings and it's a good reminder about who um, what our typical findings are what are atypical findings and who are the more likely individuals to present with atypical so typical would be substernal chest pain that they might describe as pressure or crushing discomfort that radiates to her jaw or to their left shoulder atypical would be someone who complains of just lightheadedness or shortness of breath. Maybe they complain of pain in their extremity. They might have GI symptoms like epigastric pain, nausea. Um, they may complain of just being sweaty or weak or a combination of any of these atypical. And those should prompt your um, prompt your decision making to grab a 12 lead on these patients because it can be uh, the first symptoms related to uh, ACS or acute, or acute coronary syndrome. And then as for which patients should you consider higher probability of having atypical presentation? Um, I don't know if anybody wants to put in a chat, like a guess, which would be helpful to know that you guys are listening. <laughs> Give it a few minutes. Maybe I'll see if I can pull up the chat to see who's, uh, or the list who's here and ask somebody. How about station 41? I assume that there's more than one person on that one. Any thoughts about what you think what, who might be atypical? We gave away. <laughs> I don't know. We didn't. It's all right. Throw something out. Hey, who? who we're, what's we're that? What would you say? Above age of 40? Diabetics. Diabetics. Everyone, yep. Everyone's atypical. <laughs> Good. 
Well, female tend to be related to atypical. Diabetics, right on. Nice work, guys and gals. And over the age of 40, I think is what was someone had said, but older population, male or female, regardless of their gender. Those are the patients that we're going to potentially. And thank you so much for being participating, being put on the spot. You guys were right on. Anyways, so a reminder that patients that are female, diabetic, and potentially an older population are at higher risk of having an atypical presentation. So reaching for that 12 leads sooner than later and having it in your differential diagnosis would be helpful. Um, I just pulled up our altered mental status in our chest pain uh, protocol, you know, with uh, the patient seeming to be confused, checking the blood glucose, which EMS did too, consideration of substance abuse, which EMS did ask about would be appropriate. And as for, um, let me just see who wants to talk. Um, Jeff Gutridge, I'm going to silence you. Unless you have something to say. Anyways, um, chest pain, these are going to be patients that we're looking for SATs to be within 94, 98%, getting a 12 lead within 10 minutes of uh, patient arrival, and then consideration of aspirin unless there's an allergy, and consideration of nitro unless there's a contraindication, um, and then treating a pain if it's appropriate. Great. Thank you, guys. So on to the next case. Um, do we have Chris Kime? Awesome. Sweet. And if, and if I could just add on that last case, I just, yeah. the, the real strength there is just having that low threshold for getting the 12 lead because, you know, getting that at multiple points in time is really critical for those. So it was great, great job by the uh, AMR crew on getting that 12 lead. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, and Chris, if you're ready. Yeah, hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, thanks, Dr. Gadbois. Um, this case was a uh, dispatch to a 66-year-old male that was reportedly stuck, uh, struck in the head by a large tree out um, north of Battleground Lake. Arrived on scene to a wooded area um, near uh, kind of a, a rural residence. Uh, found the patient being packaged by uh, Clark Callett's crew. Uh, he was pale, diaphoretic. The crew on scene reported that uh, the patient had a either an open or uh, a depressed skull fracture. He had some uh, C-spine area crepitus and some T-spine area deformity. Uh, they finished packaging while I was uh, prepping some stuff in the ambulance, getting ready for a possible intubation. Uh, first vitals, pressure was 110 over 88, so that was a little low at 88%. Uh, they placed him on a non-rebreather right away, the engine crew. Uh, we loaded and um, quickly started transporting. I got a line as we were leaving, um, started with fluids as the pressure was kind of on the softer side and his heart rate was elevated. Uh, first full set of vitals, heart rate was 133. Respiratory rate was elevated at 32. Uh, sat on a non rebreather was 94%. Uh, next few sets of vitals were kind of similar. Pressure on the softer side, heart rate uh, above 130, and respiratory rate also increased. Uh, the end titles are very low, but I think that's just because the uh, nasal cannula wasn't reading accurately. Uh, we were considering intubation. But due to uh, his shock index and our concern for um, peri intubation, cardiac arrest, or uh, hypotension, and the patient was oxygenating and, and breathing effectively on his own, we opted to manage his airway um, in a BLS manner. Uh, he was given 50 of fentanyl, which is just a reduced dose due to his shock index. Uh, that hey, last Chris, set of vitals was, yep. Can you talk about? Um what shock index is and uh, how you deter like how you determine the the value and what your concerns were. Sure. For those um, who don't use shock index in their own um, clinical 
decision making? Sure. Um, Jacques and basically his heart rate being greater than his systolic blood pressure. And I know that that is that puts the patient at a significant risk for peri intubation cardiac arrest. Um, so that was that was kind of my thought process. So we were trying to resuscitate before we intubated. Yeah. And the the thought process was just, you know, at what point are we going to be forced to act? And you know, if he starts vomiting or if there's other airway complications, obviously that's a problem, but not as big of a problem if he goes into cardiac arrest from my induction agent or from my intubation attempt. So I opted to continue with BLS and just be ready. You know, we had suction ready and our, our full um, RSI setup uh, nice. ready to go and in hand. And I was sitting at the head of the bed waiting, uh, but we, we didn't have to. Awesome. And then uh, that was kind of my, my thought process. Awesome. What do you think is um, hypotension was related to? I, I think, think it, maybe a couple of things, either neurogenic shock or uh, he was bleeding and, or, or both. Mm -hmm. um, it was significant trauma. He had significant spinal trauma. So, yeah, I thought he was either bleeding into, um, into his chest cavity somewhere or his abdomen or, or it was just neurogenic shock. Okay. And um, if he became more hypotensive after that liter of crystalloids, would, would, what would you be your next... Uh... Next thought to um, manage his blood pressure. A, a presser for sure. So it would have gone to um, to norepi. Awesome. Um, yeah, I you know I was my I was kind of hoping to get to the hospital and have them resuscitate with blood products, um, so that I'm not just filling them full of uh, you know LR and, and not helping much if it was you know hypovolemic shock. Yeah. No. Totally. And you know. Um, as we know that crystalloids don't have any oxygen carrying capacity. And if we're worried about hemorrhage, um, giving them, they're already losing blood, giving them more, more volume that doesn't necessarily transport oxygen isn't helpful. So if you are really worried about hemorrhagic shock, blood products would be ideal. And since we had kind of a mixed bag, was it neurogenic versus hemorrhagic? Um, I think that that was really sound. Um, Thank you so much, Chris, for your pre-hospital presentation. Um, Pulsera, for, yeah. Pulsera for this patient uh, was that they were coming with a head injury patient that had sustained a trauma by a tree branch. They had called most of that information over the radio, unless there's anything you wanted to talk about on the radio call, Chris. Nope. Okay. Um, they notified the hospital that they had a tachycardic hypotensive or at least a borderline blood pressure of 100 over 60, SATs of 96%, um, tachypnic, and a GCS of 8. So obviously concerning for an impending airway problem given his GCS had injured self and then uh, hemodynamically um, concerning with a normal blood glucose of 157. The pre... the Review of the pre-hospital care, um, I, I bolded spinal precautions because in reaching out to the ED physician for this patient, she had felt that they did a really great job of immobilizing the patient. But I think that there were some other stuff too. Um, they documented a blood glucose, make sure as the area of improvement to make sure it's in your chart as well. But it was obviously in Pulsera. They managed the patient pretty um, adequately with BLS airway control. Their scene time was, I think, nine minutes. If I remember correctly, let me just go back. Um, yeah, like excellent scene time for a full trauma. Um, they obtained serial vital signs or documentation, both on their physical exam mechanism injury, as well as their decision making was really sound. And they notified the hospital appropriately to um, be able to activate a full trauma. So in the emergency room, the first set of vital signs is the patient's heart rate was 124. His blood pressure was 74 over 50. They didn't record a respiratory rate in his room air sats were 94%. Um, the physical exam, they mentioned that the patient had a hematoma and a laceration over the left parietal skull. He, his pupils were two millimeters reactive. He was moaning. There was blood in his posterior pharynx and his breast sounds were diminished. Um, his left upper extremity was moving, but there was no movement in his right or his bilateral lowers. 
and his renal, uh, rectal tone was uh, abnormal. Um, because of his hypotension, they gave him some crystalloids. They did a fast exam, which is a focused abdominal sonographic test by ultrasound to see if there was maybe any intra um, thoracic or intra abdominal free fluid, which they didn't find any at that bedside exam. They continue to resuscitate him with at this point with crystalloids and with blood products, fresh frozen, frozen plasma. And once they were able to get his blood pressure up, they intubated him. They documented that his intubation went smoothly, but he had multiple episodes of post intubation hypotension. Um, so they he ended up getting multiple units of blood. He got crystalloids and then he got multiple doses of push dose phenylephrine in order to maintain his blood pressure. Um, of note that uh, the patient, I'm trying to remember something real quick about him. Oh, that he couldn't get his MRI of his spine after his CT for um, a period of time because of how hypotensive he was. And then his shock index, based off of the vital sign I'm reporting up here, is 1.67. And you may remember that his shock index for pre-hospital lowest values was 1.2. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, his CT showed a right intracranial hemorrhage in the parietal aspect, as well as the subdural and the subarachnoid. He had multiple spinal fractures involving C6, C7. He had an unstable fracture at T4, T5, and he, or actually he had an unstable distraction injury at T4, T5 and a T9 injury. He had bilateral hemoneumothoraxis with the worst one being on the right side. He had bilateral rib fractures one through 10 on both sides. He had a right scapular sternal fracture and a clav clavicular fracture. After coming back from CT, this is just a quick view of the CT of his thoracic spine, partially of his, his uh, cer cervical and lumbar, but here's C4 where you can see that it's fractured through this portion here with bone fragments um, exceed, leading into the spinal canal. And then you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine. C9 also has a fracture defect here um, that was mentioned on the CT. So after coming back from CT, he, in continuing to be resuscitated for his hypotension, he ended up getting bilateral chest tubes. He had a central line and an arterial line placed, and he went to the, what neurosurgery was consulted. Um, he went to MRI to get further imaging to, of his spine to see how extensive his injury and his spinal cord injury was. And he went uh, directly to the operating room with neurosurgery where they performed a T4 and partial T3 laminectomy, decompression of his spinal cord, as well as a T2 through T6 fusion. After um, surgery, he went to the ICU. He was noted to not be following any commands, although the patient never um, became alert enough to test this, but neurosurgery felt that he probably had an incomplete paraplegia where he had no use of, likely no use of his legs and he would at best have impaired use of his arms. Um, because of his rib injuries, both pulmonary contusions, pneumothorax and rib fractures, he developed severe ARDS. Um, and uh, they transitioned him to comfort care once his son, after a period of time of watching, I think it was, yeah, nine days, he wasn't improving and stated that his father would not want to live in a life that he couldn't take care of himself. So he passed away on hospital day nine. Awesome. So I thought it might be a good opportunity um, to talk about shock index and we'll talk about neuro neurogenic shock in the um, protocols. But so shock index is when you calculate um, heart rate divided by systolic blood pressure, and it predicts uh, the patient if they're going to have a chance of being in shock. You may say, well, doesn't an elevated heart rate and a low blood pressure predict the possibility of shock or the existence of shock? And that's true. But the shock index can be more sensitive for subtle signs of shock, especially in patients that are having compensatory um, shock where their body is not necessarily developing that kind of later stages of shock that we've known as tachycardic and hypotension, or that because the patient's on medications that prevent them, prevent their 
their uh, physiology to develop signs of shock. So it can be an early predictor when we don't have the late findings um, present yet. So normal range is 0 0.5 to 0 0.7. As we near a shock index of one or greater than one, it predicts the increased risk for mortality and markers for increased risk of morbidity. And what that means is that not only will it predict that the patient will potentially could die um, because they're developing shock, but it also lets us know that this patient might need a massive transfusion protocol or that they might be um, they might need a procedure done sooner than later, especially if we're not seeing uh, vital signs that are, are pointing towards decompensated shock. Um, and that even with elevated regions in the shock index, it's related to, it, can, it is proven to be related to lower circulatory volume or lower uh, left ventricular and diastolic pressures, even when vital signs are reportedly to be in normal range. From what I could find in the data, that there was more fine tuning, more complicated um, formulas for identifying shock index that included the MAP, since we've always, we often talk about MAPs as being more, um, more conducive to, to identifying patients if they're perfusing their organs, as well as geriatric and uh, pediatric populations. Um, the shock index that I found in reviewing this a little bit further is that you use the shock index times the age for uh, consideration of geriatric patients but and it's it, depending on the data that it, the population it's looking at as in like a de, um, identifying or predicting the shock index time to age was better at identifying um, morbid, morbidity or mortality in patients when used with an age with an age uh, identifier, but nonetheless, um, shock index is helpful in predicting hemorrhagic shock in most of the studies that I found, um, which is helpful in identifying patients that need to be further resuscitated either with blood products or with intervention, especially when it's paired with their age. And then, yeah. Um, I have a question. It was mentioned yes. about pressors. Uh, if fluids had not worked to bring this patient's blood pressure up, if we're thinking it's to blood loss in our protocol, it clearly states it's contraindicated in hypovolemic patients. Yeah. Is no concern for, you know, creating multiple organ dysfunction syndrome with giving pressors to somebody who's hypovolemic secondary to blood loss? It's a good question. And um, interestingly, it's come up um, outside of this presentation two other times, um, one for an RSI patient and another, um, I believe Camus, had a question about that as well. So it's a really good point is that when we have a patient that we believe are, is suffering hemorrhagic shock, if that's a stabbing or shooting or a high mechanism, such as like a motor vehicle crash or a tree branch falling on them, we do not want to be reaching first for crystalloids. Um, I'm sorry, we don't be reaching for pressors, sorry. Um, but I was thinking is that we ideally would be reaching for blood products and that's what we do in the hospital setting. But in the pre-hospital setting, we are limited by what resources we have. So we should be reaching for crystalloids. Um, and in talking, in having a couple, a couple cases recently that um, I've reached out to our trauma colleagues to ask them, given the limitations that we have in our county, as some EMS agencies have blood, especially some um, HEMS programs, what they would prefer it to, it to look like. And I think in answering your question that you pose is that we have two potential things going on with this patient, either spinal cord injury leading to spinal shock or hemorrhagic shock or both, um, in that if we're going with, hey, we don't have blood products and we think that this is potentially neurogenic shock, we do have something that we can lean forward towards. But I think also when we're dealing with hemorrhagic shock, um, you know, we're, as a reminder for everybody, that we're really aiming for permissive hypotension. So we shouldn't be treating their blood pressure unless they are altered or it's below a systolic of 90. Um, but if that's for our our hemorrhagic shock, but 
if we are finding that we're one um, having patients that are having systolic blood pressures or altered mental status, then we would be reaching for crystalloids. And especially if we um, are getting ready to intubate a patient, if we've exhausted our crystalloid, which is about a liter. Um, actually, let me see if I can pull up. Um, Uh, let me see if I can pull up what uh, Dr. Timmons had mentioned, but hmm. we may need to augment their blood pressure, especially for a procedure that is necessary, such as intubation with some pressors and then go back to crystalloid, um, crystalloid resuscitation. Um, just a second. And Dr. Gagwa, well, while you look, well, you look that up. I'll, I'll make a comment. Uh, so from station forty-one, I think that's a it's a great question. You're absolutely right. And so, stepping back, the big picture approach. What I really appreciate about the pre-hospital approach to this patient is that there's a lot of thought that went into it. Um, and so, as I follow the thought process, you got a patient with tachycardic, hypotensive, but also with a neuro deficit. So that means could be hemorrhagic shock could be neurogenic shock. If you say, I gave the patient a liter of crystalloid, still hypotensive, neuro deficits, I was concerned about neurogenic shock and I started a presser, that's, uh, that's a very reasonable thought process. And it's different from a patient that has no neuro deficits and is just tachycardic and hypotensive. So the key thing is the thought process that goes into it, like why you're doing what you're doing, and if you think through it and you're like, this is really not clear to me, I'm not sure what to use, bring in medical control. Um, but if, if you think it's neurogenic shock, then you're justified in using pressors. If there's no neuro deficits, you can't really make a case for neurogenic shock and you treat it like hemorrhagic shock. Yeah. Station 41, do you, do you feel like that answers the question or do you have follow up questions? Yeah, so on a straightforward call, let's say we go on a DSW or stabbing or trauma where the patient is bleeding out, and we know that the shock is due to hypovolemia. Mm -hmm. If we're giving volume resuscitation with the crystalline flu fluid, and we can't get their pressures up, I know in our protocol it states it's contraindicated to uh, give pressors, and I'm assuming it's due to concerns for MOTS. Um, yep. So do we give it or do we not? This, I guess. Don't give it. Don't give don't, it. Straight uh, no, no reason to suspect neurogenic shock. Don't give it. Um, it's it's only the thing that makes this case different is that you've got evidence that suggests that there might be neurogenic shock, but yeah, straightforward gunshot wound, no no neuro deficits. You know, it's uh, it's acting like a horse. Treat it like a horse. Most most patients die in trauma from hemorrhagic shock, and and what they need is bleeding control, and which is you know we do everything we can in the pre-hospital setting to control the bleeding. Um, and then we need to get them to the hospital so they can go to the OR for bleeding control and blood products. I think the, uh, excellent um, explanation. And what I, I would agree, I think that uh, so one thing I would add to that is that unlike medical patients, we're, when we're dealing with hemorrhagic causes for shock and trauma patients, that we're not looking for. Um, management until they're until they're altered or their systolic blood pressure is under 90. But like in medical patients, that we don't use that cutoff. So we have a, as as it's mentioned, we have more tolerance for hypotension. So that's the permissive hypotension. Now, you would be giving IV um, IV fluid. sensitive. Sorry. I don't know if that was somebody that meant to say something, but anyways, um, so you're managing patients in trauma with crystalloids, but in this in one, in a rare example or not so rare example, when you've got a trauma patient who is also needing to be intubated and you're trying to get their pressures up so they don't arrest with intubation, if you have given them crystalloids, a, and you know, obviously, I don't know if anybody else besides Dr. Mock is on this call, but in speaking with trauma, that giving them, giving them 
a brief period of pressors to facilitate intubation so that they don't go into a rest for intubation is appropriate, and then switching back to crystalloids. Um, and I'm just pulling up her email. So we advocate in trauma, we advocate for permissive hypotension with systolics between 90 and 100. Preferences for IV fluids and then blood products before initiation of vasopressor support. Ideally, somebody would hit the goal of systolic blood pressure 90 with IV fluids and blood products, no pressors, and then we would try and drive it up higher. So if we're dealing with having to do a procedure that we know is going to potentially make them more hypotensive than a period of short-term pressors to facilitate the procedure, I think is appropriate. I don't know what you say, Dr. Ma. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's the consideration, and no, it's and I think if and if you document that that's your thought process and that's what you do, then then we're going to support you in that. But I think this case is a really great example of less is more. Like this is a patient that's likely to have peri arrest, uh, oh sorry, peri intubation hypotension, um, and potential peri intubation arrest. Um, so we, you know, less is more. You know, BLS the airway, manage the basics. Um, but I think if you if you document that thought process, um, that's reasonable. But that's going to be those are going to be very very rare cases. Absolutely, and I think that that bode that bore out in what happened with this patient is that he was still hypotensive before they went with intubation. They resuscitated him, they intubated him, and then he had multiple episodes of hypotension following. So. Um, absolutely sound decision making, especially when how difficult it must be to know that it's in your scope of practice to do a procedure, bring a patient in that you know is critically ill and realize that you would prefer to have that patient intubated, but making the decision to not and making a really good predictive uh, decision to do so. Thank you guys for your questions and your um, contribution. And thanks, Chris, as well, for presenting that pre-hospital course. Anybody else have any thoughts or questions? No, I just summarize by saying, you know, what from, you know, from the medical director's perspective, what we value is your ability to think on your feet and to apply your knowledge to the situation in front of you and to document why you did what we did, what, what you did. And so I just think this, that's a great example of doing this, having a mental model of what's going on with the patient, thinking through the changes, and then explaining the decision making. Agree. Agree, and I'll say that um, when I gave the feedback, or when I requested the feedback with um, the ER doc, I had pointed out that actually I think they did a lot of really good decision making off of not just off the spinal immobilization. All right, so the next case is the 79 year old. Um, this is a case that was uh, that was suggested by um, Wade Taylor, and unfortunately he's. Um, unable to present as he's uh, vacationing with his family, but he missed his, um, he sends his apologies for not presenting the pre-hospital side. So a 79-year-old male found in bed um, at the, the hotel part of the um, casino. He was um, found to be altered and potentially with right up uh, right-sided abdominal pain. He was alert, he was able to protect his airway, and he was tachypnic. Um, and they noted that he was pink, warm, and diaphoretic, and there were no signs of active bleeding. Vital signs were obtained by fire prior to arrival, um, heart rate 82, blood pressure 169 over 85, and tachypnic at a rate of 30. Um, his room air stats were 98%, and he was estimated about 100 kilos. His past medical history is a AAA. Um, he had, had sustained a cabbage for coronary artery disease in the past, and he had a history of Parkinson's. The medications that were reported by his wife were amlodipine, atorvastatin, duloxetine, levodopa, lorazepam, mitadrine, mirtazapine, and xarelto. Um, their story was... Oh, I'm just kind of like ate a candy bar is that he woke up um, earlier in the morning and he was getting ready to go out of state. Um, 
I think so in with further knowledge down in the hospital side of things is that he was visiting from California and was getting ready to go back to California. So he got up, he was packing his stuff. He um, took his meds uh, with a candy bar in that he developed rigors, um, uh, uncontrolled tremors, and his wife thought it was his Parkinson's. Um, he was also complaining of pain and he was diaphoretic, which was atypical for him. So that's what prompted her to call 911. Prior to arrival, an IV was attempted but not um, successfully placed. And this occurred around 8.35 in the morning. Um, so the reason why I would have in bed at the casino, I perhaps went home, is because the hospital side of things says he was at the casino. So I was like, what was going on? But anyways, uh, in talking with... EMR, the patient's notes in the dispatch was concerning enough that fire even brought in a Lucas um, in the event that this patient was critically ill. Uh, at two minutes, an IV was established and he was started with 200, IV, 200 cc's of IV fluids. They found that the patient was tremulous. He was indeed complaining of abdominal pain and sometimes of right lower extremity pain. Um, he was very um, un atypical he kept on saying i see green everything is green and that he could answer questions about himself but any other question outside of himself was i don't know and he checked his blood glucose and it was 148 at 16 minutes they got a full set of vital signs they noted that he was hypertensive 187 over 96 he was tachypnic at 35 and his room air sats were 98 percent his end title was low at 16. he had woke at 7 30 to pack for leaving town when he became tremulous um is the story that his wife provided in that at 18 minutes, they got a 12 lead. Um, the 12 lead looked like this narrow complex, some ectopy, but nothing that was really concerning for a STEMI or an arrhythmia. I think I have to go this way. Sorry. In that, um, he was concerning enough in presentation that they placed him on defib pads when they got him in the ambulance. They initiated transport at 20 minutes. They got multiple 12 leads that were essentially unchanged. Um, another set of vital signs, he's now tachycardic at 104. He's hypertensive at 175 over 139, respirators of 30, and title of 5. And at 29 minutes, they get another set of vital signs. Um, he's no longer as tachycardic. He's no longer tachycardic at rate of 89. He's hypertensive at 181 over 98. Uh, tachypnic at 32. Sats of 96 percent. And Zentitle is increased to 22. At 30 minutes, they get another 12 lead unchanged. At 39 minutes, he clenches up. He turns his head to the right, and he appears to be having a seizure. So um, EMS provides him with five milligrams of Versed, which improves his uh, tone. But at 59, at 41 minutes, they note that he's starting to become bradycardic. He bradies down to 59. At 42 minutes, he bradies down to 38. And this is essentially the same time as they're pulling into the hospital. Um, at 51 minutes, they arrive at the hospital and they see that he's agonal. Um, they feel for a pulse. He's in PEA rest. They initiate CPR and they place an eye gel. The Pulsera notification is that this patient is presenting with diaphoresis, tachypnea, altered mental status, and his past history included a cabbage and a AAA, and that he was oriented only to himself. At that point, they hadn't had a chance to update um, through Pulsera that he had arrested. I'm just going to cough for one second. Hold Um, and the good about this patient, um, or at least in the pre-hospital care, is that they got serial vital signs, including an end title, noting that he was um, hypocarbic. They got a blood glucose. They got serial 12 leads to evaluate if there were any changes, especially because of how critically ill the patient appeared, even in the dispatch notes enough that, um, that uh, Lucas was brought into the patient's room. And that defib pads were placed, even though they weren't finding any arrhythmias yet. And they notified the hospital, and they promptly identified him being in cardiac arrest before um, getting him unloaded from the ambulance. Uh, so areas for improvement, maybe an earlier set of vital signs in 12 lead, as we have them as being a little later in the presentation. 
So the story from the hospital side when they were able to talk to the wife for a little for a longer period of time is that they were visiting from California, his sister, and that they were headed back home today, and that he has it as mentioned earlier that he had Parkinson's and that she initially gave him Ativan, which is what he typically gets when he gets tremors. He didn't get better, so she called 911. And that at the point that EMS brought the patient in, it was documented that he had undergone three rounds of CPR, no meds for PEA arrest. When they did their full first pulse check, he had ROSC. The exchange was IGEL for an ET tube without any complications. And his labs were significant for a pretty low pH of 6.84 um, and a bicarb of 10, meaning that he was really acidotic um, and for probably a metabolic cause. His troponin was detectable, but serial troponin checks were unchanged. So I don't think he was having a STEMI or an instemi. They did a imaging of his this imaging of his of his aorta from his chest, abdomen, and pelvis, as well as a CT of his head that showed no abnormalities. Hold on one sec, I gotta. Sorry, because of his um, acidosis, he did get 100 mil equivalents of bicarb, and they optimized his ventilator settings to help improve his acidosis. His subsequent labs showed that he was actually normalizing, returning back to his normal pH and um, bicarb. And that by the time he was being transferred to the ICU, he was responding. He was trying to pull his ET tube out so they didn't cool him. During his hospitalization, he had an EEG to evaluate if he had um, a seizure or had seizure-like activity. That was negative. Did an echo that showed that he did have some reduced left ventricular function and that his aortic root was dilated, but nothing. Um, that needed to be acted upon and that he was discharged on hospital day two with the diagnosis of either hy orthostatic hypotension versus adverse response to Versed versus possible seizure. He was discharged neurologically intact. So um, this was, this was uh, given to me to present to you guys because it was just an interesting presentation for EMS. So the educational tidbit I have for you guys is that this is a weird case and people are strange in that trust your spidey senses. If you think that the patient is concerning you, doesn't make you feel comfortable, that you're worried about that the patient's going to um, digress or uh, get sick or get ahead of the curve with having the proper equipment ready, if not already applied. So again, another case representing altered mental status and later cardiac arrest. So we mentioned this in a previous case, um, checking for glucose and identifying if there's a risk for um, substance use. Anybody have any questions or thoughts about this case? It's one of those cases you just, you know, like things don't add up. I don't know what's going on, but I think this person's legit. I agree. And it's just a great job of like staying on your toes and being ready for the worst case scenario. Yeah, absolutely. All right. On to the next case of a 79 year old who was on a ladder. I don't know if they, I don't, this was a case that I had. So I'm not sure if um, she was cutting branches or doing, doing like um, gutter cleaning or whatnot, but Again, 79 years young. Um, the patient had fallen off the ladder. She was complaining of left upper extremity pain. She was alert. Uh, and I should say, I wasn't at the unseen, so this is pre-hospital care. Um, her airway was open and protecting. Her skin was pale, cool, and she had a pulseless left upper extremity, but there's no signs of external hemorrhage. Um, but signs of internal hemorrhage, yes. Uh, two minutes, vital signs were obtained. She was known to have a heart rate of 94, blood pressure of 136 over 100, respiratory rate of 30, 
Room air sats of 93% and her blood glucose was reported at 141. She was estimated to be about 68 kilos. Her past medical history is hypertension, hypothyroid, and a previous TIA. The patient's meds included amlodipine, citalopram, ibuprofen, levothyroxine, and oxycodone. The story um, was that she was on the sixth rung of a ladder and lost her balance. She didn't know how she landed, but fire's chart said that she landed on top of a planter box. The patient was complaining of left upper extremity pain, left chest pain. She was also nauseated and dizzy. In, in one of the responding agencies' um, chart, they had uh, even documented that the patient said the pain was worse than any childbirth pain she ever had. She did not strike her head, nor did she lose consciousness. This call came in around 1604. When uh, the transporting agency arrived, uh, the vital signs were obtained. We just told you guys an IV was established at two minutes, and they found the patient sitting upright in a chair with fire. Um, and further review, the patient had put herself in the chair, so it was the first presentation for her to be in a chair. I'm going to put myself on silent for a second. At seven minutes, um, patient was treated with 50 micrograms of fentanyl. They noted that she had anterior left-sided um, chest wall pain and swelling, and that her left upper extremity had a contusion. She had no pulses, and her radial um, radial pulse was pre was absent, and that she was complaining of numbness in all of her left upper extremity. Uh, she was initially that left upper extremity was gray and cold. She was given another dose of fentanyl at 50 micrograms, and she was given Zofran, 8 milligrams at 9 minutes. She was placed in a splint for transport, and she was also placed in spinal precautions at 15 minutes. Initiation of transport at 18 minutes. Um, en route at 22 minutes, she was given another 100 micrograms of fentanyl. Her blood pressure was 153 over 90, her heart rate was 49, her respiratory rate was 24, and her room air stats were 94%. At 31 minutes, they got another set of vital signs. Now her heart rate is 105, her blood pressure is essentially the same at 141 over 107, her respiratory rate of 24, and her stats of 94%, and they arrived to the hospital at 32 minutes. Um, they put in Pulsera that it's a yellow, and this is what they had documented. It fell off the sixth rung of the ladder, bruising to the left chest and armpit. No CMS in the left arm, no loss of consciousness, head or neck or back pain, and treating with fentanyl zofran, with the vital signs reported um, here that we've already talked about. So the charge nurse didn't know if this needed to be upgraded to a trauma versus a um, trauma consult based off of the height wasn't high enough, but the question was this lack of CMS in the arm. So our trauma um, guidelines is if there's a new neurological deficit, would make that a full trauma um, and you have a mechanism. So we asked is this a spinal cord injury or a fracture? Because, you know, sometimes patients will say reduced motor or sensory or potentially even loss of pulses because the fracture has um, contributed to it. Or is this a neurological issue like a spinal in injury? And we couldn't raise them. We um, couldn't raise them again. So we called dispatch and they couldn't raise them. And then we did get, they paged them. So they got back and said that there's no back pain just in the arm, but yeah, it's a new neuro deficit. They didn't think it was a deformity, so we activated it as a full trauma. Um, so the good is early serial vital signs. Uh, physical exam was detailed. Pain control was considerate, and spinal precautions were um, obtained and maintained. Pulsera notification was placed in in the um, in the Pro and the app, I guess, and then um, reassessment and documentation of the patient. Um, areas for improvement. So our modified traumas 
would be 15 minutes. Our full traumas would be 10 minutes. This was 18 minutes, so a little outside of our goal time. And then making sure that you are checking for ongoing communication, especially on that Pulsera. If you get some kind of notification back from the charge nurse that's texting you on Pulsera, that you don't assume that it's just saying that everything's fine, that there might be some questions that are pertinent to notifying the right teams. So in the um, in the emergency room, this is a picture of her when she first presented. Uh, I think I zoom in. If I don't, I'll zoom in. Um, so there was no palpable or doppelable radial pulse or um, or uh, brachial pulse. So our concern was that she had an ischemic limb. Uh, CT of her chest, abdomen, pelvis showed that she had a uh, injury to her left axillary artery, and there was active bleeding into the glenohumeral area. Uh, they measure her hematoma to be 12.7 by 6.7 by 12.9 centimeters in this space. She developed hypotension that we gave her blood products for, and that vascular surgery was consulted on an emergent basis, and both vascular and trauma took her to the OR to gain control of this bleeding axillary artery and ischemic limb. Um, in speaking with the vascular surgeon, he, he was interesting. He said that uh, before the case, he had said, oh, these are pretty, these aren't as difficult. You know, we just remove all the hematoma and look for where the bleeding, um, the bleeding pipe is. And then he's like, the biggest thing is that these can retract into the chest wall and be difficult to gain access to. But once we, once we go after the leaking pipe, we um, control it and then uh, we uh, graft it. So. She underwent exploration and repair of the left distal subclavian and proximal axillary artery um, the following day on the 1st of October. They noted that her extremity appeared to be cold again, so they did an arterial duplex that noted that there was tenosis to the left axillary artery and complete occlusion of the brachial and radial artery, so they brought her back to the OR where she underwent exploration and thrombectomy of the left brachial artery and the left axillary artery and also went, underwent a fasciotomy due to concerns, high concerns for compartment syndrome. On the 4th of October, she had a washout of the left forearm fasciotomy sites and a wound vac was placed. On the 11th of October, she had a partial clo closure of the left forearm wound and reapplication of the wound vac. On the 17th, she went back to the OR for partial closure of the left forearm wound and reapplication of the wound back. And then they um, they incised and drained an abscess in her axilla. And by the time that I um, looked her up, which was Friday or Saturday, <laughs> um, she was still hospitalized. She had some flexion of her left fingers and wrist, but no ability for extension. There was no comment about a brachial plexus injury. Uh, And that um, during her hospitalization, she developed AFib with RVR that resolved with medical management and that she also had traumatic rhabdomyolysis leading to acute kidney injury that had also resolved during her um, hospitalization. So and she may be closer to discharge, maybe potentially rehab. And of note, this is her non-dominant hand, so at least she has her dominant still. Um, I know that uh, early on they thought that she might have to amputate her hand, if not her whole, ex whole extremity. So it's nice to see that she was able to keep her arm. So I uh, thought I'd present a little bit about axillary artery injuries. This is a really rare, um, isolated axillary artery injuries is a really rare uh, cause for upper extremity trauma. Um, 15 to 20 percent of axillary arteries are the cause of upper extremity um, trauma, I guess. As, let me see if I say that correctly. So axillary arteries make up about 20 percent of the traumatic lesions of upper extremity, but having an isolated axillary artery is very rare. And that's usually because there's other injuries, um, such as like a brachial plexus injury or a fracture or dislocation, but 94% of axillary artery injuries are related to penetrating trauma, and that 6% are due to blunt trauma, like this case, but that's usually related to a fracture or dislocation of the, um, of the shoulder. Uh, most of the axillary artery injuries involve, or I say 
half of the axillary artery injuries involve a brachial plexus injury. I didn't show a picture, but the brachial plexus is like a a ladder-like structure that runs through the armpit and down and provides innervation to the um, extremity. And that patients with axillary artery injuries are going to present with hard signs of vascular injuries, such as a loss of pulse, that there's pulsatile arterial flow coming from the wound if the wound is open. They might have expanding or pulsatile hematoma, and you may actually be able to feel a thrill similar to a thrill when you feel over a dialysis graft or fistula, or that if you oscillate it, there will be a brewy, kind of a wishing sound. And that treatment is going to be emergent surgical exploration and repair, and depending on the case, if they think they're at risk or they already are um, experiencing uh, compartment syndrome, they may need a fasciotomy. And then this case was a case report of an elderly woman who had fallen and struck her left right chest, her pectoral area on um, a piece of furniture. So kind of a similar if that's a case where she hit her, presumably she hit her left upper, her left chest um, on a planar box, our patient. And then just a reminder of the vascular anatomy. So coming off the aorta, subclavian so artery, and then that dives down into the axillary and then further um, divides down into the extremity. And then um, a reminder of our protocol for trauma. I think that uh, even in reviewing this case, the charge nurse was thinking about potentially making it a yellow, but looking at the red criteria that this this although not a spinal cord injury but with a new motor or sensory loss would be probably more appropriate to make it a red or a full trauma but nonetheless having a trauma surgeon available when they arrive to make sure that we get the patient's necessary treatment as soon as possible anybody have any questions or thoughts on that case just one one quick thing is uh, a lot of times, even with all your settings on and the volume turned up on your Pulsera device, uh -huh. it's nearly impossible to hear uh, in the back of the rig when you're treating a patient. So uh, we all try to set them where we can see them, where you get a message, but it's usually just a tiny little icon in the corner of the screen. So it, that was creative calling dispatch and having them get a hold of us because it is pretty difficult to uh, determine unless you're looking at that while you're looking at amongst many other things. So uh, we we do try to get back to you guys if we can. But no, I appreciate. It. Yeah, and and we were to think outside the box because it's very hard to hear. Yeah, um, I will definitely say that. Uh, and even in you know with with that, that's great information. And we've been talking to Pulsera about having some kind of different tone, but I don't think if it, if it's not a matter of a different tone, it's a matter of actually hearing, it won't really matter how many different tones that we create. So, um, yeah. And as for this particular case, um, we were, you know, the difference between at that point was, do we have a trauma surgeon? there or not and does that trauma surgeon come with an OR ready for them so we uh, we got a hold of them and I think really with only only because of the assistance of dispatch and getting them paging them to notify them but uh, allowed for uh, allowed for the surgeon to be present when that patient showed up which made a big difference <laughs> And I would add uh, just a reminder, if you can go back to the trauma criteria, a pulseless extremity is also red trauma criteria. So both for the new motor deficit and for the loss of pulse, um, that you know a patient with a pulseless extremity is almost certainly going to go to the OR. So for those two reasons, it's a red, red trauma you, patient. Th thank you. I don't... I didn't see, am I missing that on the pulseless extremity? It's that third from the bottom, crushed, degloved, mangled, or pulseless Oh, extremity gotcha, gotcha. Is, yeah, is yeah. Red, red trauma criteria. Yeah. Yeah. That's, when that's, I, that's a hard sign of vascular injury yeah. um, with, and something that's likely to go to the OR, perhaps even without any imaging. Yeah, and I think like that, you know, that's the the difficulty in um, trying to convey enough information through Pulsera is that 
you know, our question was, is this a fracture? Like, is it just just like a fracture dislocation? Even when trauma came down before um, EMS arrived, they're like, wait, is it just like a bone? And they're like, no, they said it wasn't a bone. They said that this is this is another cause. Like, so we were worried at that point for a, a proximal arterial injury that left their distal extremity cold and pulseless. No, I agree, but I think that, you know, the takeaway for field personnel is you don't yeah. have a pulse in extremity for after a traumatic event. That's a that's totally. a red red. Totally. Trauma. Yep. All right. Last case. Thanks guys for your attention. So this is a two year old male. He must get called for a seizure. Um, the patient was unresponsive. His airway was open. He wasn't protecting and he was hot to touch and diaphoretic. Um, his pulse was present and there were no signs of active bleeding. Vital signs were obtained with an initial patient contact with a heart rate of 133, no blood pressure um, obtained, and a respiratory rate of 38, SpO2 of 80% on room air, and he was estimated to be 20 kilos. Um, the 20 kilos is a pretty big for a two-year-old, so I'm not sure if he was a bigger kid or close to the age of three, but nonetheless, um, we would be expecting for a normal size to be about 14 kilos. His past medical history is that he had an abdominal hernia, he had no meds, and that the story was that he was eating lunch, he became lethargic, and he was lower to the floor, followed by tonic clotic activity. He woke up fine about two hours earlier, but was acting a little sick. And he received Tylenol by his parent 45 minutes prior to arrival or prior to this incident. There was no reports of recent trauma. All prescriptions were out of reach. There was no concern that he ingested anything, either prescription or toxin. This call occurred at 11.48 in the morning. Vital signs as reported previously. And they placed him on a non-rebreather because of his hypoxia. And they noted that he was hot. He was unresponsive. His teeth were clenched um, at two minutes. And then he was see they thought he was seizing um, with a uh, further right gaze. So at two minutes, they gave him 2.5 milligrams of IM Versed, um, which they documented that his, his tone improved. At three minutes, they placed a 24 gauge IV and gave him 50 mLs of fluids, which is less than 20 cc per kilogram bolus, which would have been 400. So not always important in any administration of fluids, but especially in pediatrics that we're not overshooting. So good to document that. Um, at eight minutes, his heart rate was 127, no blood pressure recorded, respiratory rate of 40. His SATs are improved from 80 to 98%, and his blood glucose is 126. At nine minutes, I believe that they presumed that he was seizing again, so he got another 2.5 milligrams of IV versed. At 13 minutes, he had a heart rate of 136, now a blood pressure of 112 over 60, respiratory rate of 48 and SATs of 100% and titles elevated at 62. His temperature is documented as 101.5, so he got, at 19 minutes, 120 milligrams of rectal Tylenol. Um, I will say that in reviewing the normal normal vital signs for this age, he was a little tachypnic and only a little tachycardic at this point, but the rest of his vitals were within normal limits for his age. He was placed on four liters nasal cannula at 20 minutes and transport was initiated at 30 minutes. At 31 minutes, they record another set of vital signs, tachycardic at 144, um, I think borderline hypertensive at this point at 126 over 76, respiratory rate of 48 and SpO2 of 96 and tidal down trending at 52. Um, they noted at 36 minutes that his pupils appeared to be constricted, so they gave him two milligrams of Narcan thinking that this might be a uh, an advertent overdose as well. At 40 minutes, they elected to intubate him with uh, 40 milligrams of ketamine and 20 milligrams of rocuronium. Um, they used a 5-0 ET tube. I'm presuming this is cuffed because I believe that we should have all cuffed tubes at this time. But anyways, a 5-0 ET tube. Yeah, so and, it, was, it was a cuffed tube. Okay. And um, so the reason why I even ask is that is that 
when we just for the people listening is that when I'm looking up these patients, these pediatric patients, I'm making sure that the equipment is appropriate for their age. And so cuffed is going to be a different size than uncuffed. So it's appropriate for a cuffed FIBO. Um, they document that they failed because they couldn't get the end title CO2 to read. So because they couldn't verify by end title that the tube is in the right place, they pulled it and they placed a 2.0 eye gel at 48 minutes, which is uh, age appropriate size. And at 49 minutes, they arrived to their hospital. Um, this was a patient transfer to Legacy, so there is no Pulsera. And I'll have, if you're okay, Dr. Mock, to do the QA discussion. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, it's a really challenging case. You know, the pediatric patient, um, persistent seizures. Um, there's a really good job obtaining the history, searching the scene, um, looking for potential causes of seizures. And then, you know, if you if you don't have a waveform, then you can't say your tube's in the right place. And so if there's any doubt, um, you did, you know, there's the right thing to pull it. Um, we talked, I talked with, with both of the medics on this call. Um, you know, one of the ways you can strengthen your chart is to just document, the, really document like why you made the decision to intubate. I, I think it's it's reasonable, but you know, document, you know, failure to protect the airway. Um, this the stylet and the pediatric bougie is an equipment issue that that work, we're working with agency leadership to rectify. Um, but you uh, a pediatric bougie will go down to a 4.0 ET tube, and that's helpful. And then um, talking with this crew, they um, uh, they did not have a stylet um, that could go into this cuffed ET tube. So again, we're working. That's that's a supply issue that we're working to uh, that we're working to rectify. We want to make sure that you have all the equipment you need to do your job. Um, we talked about the the way the weight was obtained, so that you know the the length of this measured, and then they used um, the pediatric dosing guide. So all of all of that was appropriate. Um, the uh, my take on the naloxone is that you, you know you have a patient that was that was breathing, seizing. And um, so I mean, we give naloxone for respiratory depression for a suspected opioid overdose. Um, so even if even if the patient got into an opioid and is seizing because of that, the naloxone is not going to fix it. But I think it's you know I, skip that, save the naloxone for you know this is an opioid overdose um, with hypoventilation. Um, and then just including the documentation about that the patient was continuing to seize. And talking with both the medics, it was clear that there was, you know, continued suspected seizure activity. Um, but that's, it's really helpful to flesh out in the documentation. Um, the, uh, and then the last, the last thing I would say is so in, you know, we still have succinylcholine as our first line paralytic. Um, in this case, there's no contraindication of succinylcholine, and the and succinylcholine is a better choice for a paralytic for a seizing patient because you get your neuro exam back quickly. And so, if you give this patient rock, it's really hard to figure out if they're still seizing. Um, and so, for it. it Specifically, you know, any any time when the neuro exam is important and you don't have a contraindication, sex is preferred and seizures probably like on top of that list. Like you really need to know if the patient's still seizing to uh, to figure out what to do next with uh, with your treatment. Thank you, and I would say I agree with you on that as well. And I would add that like right up there too is anybody with like neuro deficits either from trauma or. Um, stroke is to be able to reassess them as well. So anyone, neurological patients, we'd want to be able to get a neuro exam if we can. Um, I wrote what PD tool was used. I think that, I'm not sure if it's in the documentation for ESO or if that was what you gathered when you had a meeting with them. Yeah, and that came out of the meeting. And, and again, you know, we're looking we're just trying to find the best way to to give crews in the field the best support, um, but the the crews appropriately use the tools that were available to them. Okay, yeah, because um for me like 
you know, and looking, I'm not sure if the, if the the PD tool they was they you said they measured. So was it Roslo? So they they measured using a tape measure and oh. then brought that brought that over to um, the printed um, pediatric guide. So okay. you know do, doses were all appropriate based on that. But you know the measured weight in the hospital was uh, I think like fifteen point five kilos. So slightly overestimated weight, but I, you know, in this patient, you know, to give a slightly higher dose of Versed, slightly higher dose of ketamine rock, like not, you know, they, the, the crew followed, but, you know, both crews used the tools that were available to them appropriately. And so I, you know, I think that's, you know, that's the best, you know, the, the best we can do is to use no, of course. length length gate length based measurement. Use um, use a tool to help with dosing. Use all the tools you have to support you in these difficult cases. No, yeah, absolutely. Um, the only other thing that I noticed in reviewing this case is, um, and so let me get out of here. That they gave the two point five of Versed, and they documented that the kid's weight was twenty. But the so there's somewhere there's a discrepancy because uh, the dose for Versed would be 0 0.2 mg per kg, so that should have been closer to four. So it might be from the tool that they were using because the right. Roslo. That, yeah. That no, that's that's what's in the tool, and so you know rather than um, yeah rather than second second guessing that to you know use what's in the tool they use they use the tool that was there appropriately and um you know yeah. and we're just we're continuing to to try to find the best tool to support but they they use the tool appropriately they dosed appropriately based on the tool and so you know they did everything um correctly there yeah all right well good um in the emergency room the kid was intubated it was known that he was not vaccinated he was transferred to randall's um the hospital course was that he had a respiratory failure with hypoxia in that he had complex febrile seizure due to a virus, rhino and enterovirus. His EEG was normal and he returned to baseline. He was discharged on hospital day three with rectal diastat. Um, and this case was uh, referred by Dr. Mock to present for case reviews. And, um, you know, Dr. Mock mentioned the things that he um, br just brought up in the QA discussion. So appropriate induction agent when we want to preserve a neuro exam as, as soon as possible and using the, the equipment that you have for guidance on pediatric patients to ensure that you have the right size equipment and the right size medications. Um, so he had asked, and I think that's what you were asking me is to help with troubleshooting and titles not working. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's a good topic. Yeah, so um, I did a little bit of research. There's like a manual that um, that you could read. That's a couple hundred pages for the Life Pack twelve uh, fifteen. Um, but I tried to like get you guys the Reader's Digest version. So Dr. Ju presented in Gems, I think, in two thousand eight what they were having, what they were doing to troubleshoot when end tidal CO2 wasn't working. So Dr. Jews on the Portland side of um, our, our part of the country. <laughs> Anyways, um, they said they found that the end tidal wasn't working when it wasn't properly attached. So uh, his recommendations in their manual, I guess, over on that um, side of the river is that they one, make sure that your tubing is like stretch it out as in don't like do it all rolled up because there's a good chance that as it um, is used that it can it can unravel the connection. So strength, uh, lengthen it out and then you're going to connect the CO2 filter to the device uh, doing clockwise three turns. And when you end with the um, end tidal CO2 connection device, you want to make sure that the wings are parallel to the ground. So this is correct position and this is incorrect position. If it's not properly attached to the monitor, then um, it's a suction device that is monitoring via suction of the gases that if it's not connected properly, it won't read. So you want to make sure that you're 
device is connected properly and if it was connected properly initially and you're not getting end title that to make sure it hasn't inadvertently been twisted out a little bit so double check your connection um this is from the lifepack 15 manual uh which has 15 easy troubleshooting um guidelines um depending on what your issue or your uh, alert is on the end title when i look through these 15 um i would say that making sure that your device is connected properly and potentially shutting off your life pack and turning it back on and or changing out the end title co2 detector for another one if you have a faulty one but you can see that there are multiple troubleshooting tips for various complaints that you're observing with your end title. And then the Southwest region protocol for pediatrics with seizures. If you suspect status, which this is what this crew suspected that the dosing is 0 0.2 mg per kg that can go IV, IO, IM, or IN, and then they can repeat every five minutes until seizures stop, um, making sure that you're monitoring the respiratory status closely. If the temp is above 100.4, you are in your um, scope to give Tylenol. And if the kid's not seizing anymore, you don't need to start an IV when you arrive. But if the kid is continuing to seize, it's very helpful to have access. Um, all hypoglycemic or first-time pediatric seizure patients should be transported to the hospital. All right, anybody else have any questions or thoughts? No, just one quick tip for um, troubleshooting the entitled CO2 or knowing that it's working before you use it. You can also just blow yourself into it before, like before you hook it up and just see that you get that waveform. Um, and that's one quick way to, to verify that it's that it's working uh, before you use it if you haven't had it on the patient already. Yeah, good point. All right, so in summary, there are atypical patients for chest pain, and these can be women, diabetics, or older patients. Um, shock index can be helpful in predicting when a patient needs to be resuscitated or either in the form of um, blood products or procedure before you move towards anything, before you delay in, in uh, identifying and treating those patients because they, they can further decompensate. Um, if you don't know what's going on and your spidey senses tell you to be worried, listen to it. Um, there are hard signs for vascular injuries such as pulseless, um, arterial bleeding, expanding hematoma or thrill, and make sure that your end title is working ideally before you actually need it, if, you, if possible, but um, if you're using it and you're not getting it to work, uh, you have you can make sure that one, you have put it in correctly in the first time, first place, three counterclock turns, making sure that the wings are parallel to the ground, the wings of the adapter, and you can check in on yourself um, or you can shut off the monitor, restart, or you can try a new um, end title uh, device. All right, that's all I have. Thank you guys for your time and attention and your contributions, everybody that um, participated. Thank you.